My name is Patrick J. McGinnis, and I coined the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out, and it's why some people end up following the crowd. But we're not like them. We're part of a new species that isn't afraid to do things differently. I call us FOMO sapiens. And this is the show where you'll meet people like us, phenomenal FOMO sapiens, to learn how they find the courage and the ideas to live exceptional lives. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show for people who don't just follow the crowd, but instead take their own path to success in business and in life. I'm your host, Patrick J. McGinnis, venture capitalist by day, author and podcaster by night, and FOMO Sapiens 24-7. Now today, very special episode, very special. This is the first of a two-parter that I'm so excited to be able to present and share with you. It's important, I promise you. You will want to hear both of these episodes. Now, as you know, our theme this season is how to crush it without getting crushed, but sometimes... Sometimes you just get crushed. It happens. You do everything right, you just get crushed. So the question is, how will you respond? How will the people around you respond? What will that do to your life? How will it change your life? And that's what we're gonna be talking about today with my guest, Tristan Mace and his wife, Jordan Mace. Now, I've known Tristan for about 10 years. We met on a panel, actually. A panel about online travel, believe it or not. Why I was on that panel, it's a mystery. <laughs> but he... He had been the CEO of a company in the space and he was so brilliant. He was so young at the time. He was in mid twenties, so brilliant. And I thought to myself, this guy is somebody I want to be friends with. And we became friends. We'd actually go get sweet greens and eat them in this park on sixth Avenue in New York city in Greenwich village and talk about ideas for businesses. And I actually invested in one of the businesses that he told me about in what I like to call sweet green park, which is the park we would go to together. And then eventually he moved to the Midwest, he got married to Jordan. They moved to Kansas City and we stayed in touch in different ways. So he's just somebody that I, you know, really admired and, you know, I invested in him, right? So I really believe in the guy. And then one day he didn't show up to a Zoom and he totally went MIA. And what I didn't know was he had had a health emergency. He had something that's called fulminant quadruple organ failure and basically a lot of organ failure at the same time. And the reality is I asked him this question because we didn't talk about it in the interview, but we talked about it after. Like what what caused that? They don't actually know. They think, the doctors think it was a virus that attacked and killed his heart, but they don't really know. And so he went to the hospital thinking he had a cold and he ended up coming out with a new heart. And that is what we're gonna talk about because it is an incredible story. And there are so many elements to this story and how he and Jordan dealt with this challenge. And I just have such a personal dimension to this because as a friend of mine, I really didn't know what was going on. And then one day out of the blue, I just got an email from him. Little did I know it was Jordan. You'll see in the interview, we talk about this saying, you know, listen, this is what happened. And then we did a zoom and he looked totally normal. And it was really amazing to see somebody who'd been through such an incredible operation, just kind of be normal on a zoom. Little did I know he was struggling, but He's just, Tristan's somebody who just has incredible human and superhuman power. And so it was really shocking just to see how quickly he bounced back. But of course, this is a long process of recovery and being somebody who is an organ recipient, it's very hard. There are all kinds of ongoing health challenges and a heart typically is meant to last about 10 years. So there is that, you know, that bigger challenge about what happens at the end of 10 years. So all these things are happening. Now, something else that happened, which was quite incredible, is that about a year ago, so maybe, you know, a year and a half, two years after the transplant, I finally saw Tristan face to face. We spent some time together. I think we're going to meet for an hour, but we spent several hours together. And he told me that actually he lost like five years of memories before the surgery. So most of our friendship, the really intense times, all the Sweet Green Park times, he just didn't remember. And so... There were many things he didn't remember. He didn't remember that Donald Trump was president when he woke up. He got to get that news once again. So it really is a story that has so many layers to it. But Tristan and Jordan, you'll see the way they talk about all the things they've been through and also what they're going to do now. So the way this interview is structured is, number one, this week we're going to talk about what happened. What happened with that day when he walked into the hospital? and what happened after, and Tristan and Jordan are gonna share their story. Next week, we're gonna talk about what they are building, this new nonprofit called Valeos. 
So that is the structure. Now let me tell you a little bit more about Jordan and Tristan. They are the co-founders and board chairs of Vallejos, a nonprofit improving organ transplant outcomes through data, technology, and collaboration. And in fact, Vallejo's work helped influence the passage of a new federal law in September to overhaul the U.S. organ procurement and transplantation system. Now, when not doing that, Tristan is also a managing partner at Flyover Capital, a VC firm investing in companies and funds transforming middle America. And Jordan was an early employee at Braze. She continues there and actually helped bring that company through to an IPO on the NASDAQ in 2021. Now, my small ask this week, it's actually a big ask. A small and a big ask, go to Vallejos.org, V-A-L-E-O-S.org, read about what they're doing, consider making a donation to the work that they're doing. As you will see in this story, the work they're doing is deeply needed and very important, Vallejos.org. All right, and now onto the interview. As you know, I like to start every interview with the same questions, so I started by asking Tristan this, what's a formative decision you've had to make to get to where you are today? I think I've had a curiosity to explore things that I found interesting. And I remember when I was 12, I had learned how to code websites. There was a website called Derek's Fantasy Cars. Mm -hmm. And I wondered naively as a 12-year-old, why is it not Tristan's Fantasy Cars? Mm -hmm. And so I tried to replicate it. And for the next couple of years, learned how to make websites. And at 14, built a web design firm. And looking back, it really propelled me into design and the product and entrepreneurship and ultimately venture capital where I am now. So everybody, so Tristan and I go way back. His wife, Jordan, is here. And Jordan and I have, this is shocking to of all of us that we have not met in person just because I missed their wedding in Kansas City and that's on me. So I have regrets. However, it's right. Chris, Tristan is a very curious guy. We used to meet for lunch, brainstorming ideas in a place next to a sweet green that we dubbed Sweet Green Park. And we would meet there all the time, talking about our ideas about the world, advising each other. And he's a pure entrepreneur and a great friend. And so, you know, we, we, he moved away to Kansas City. We kept in touch. And then, you know, you were off doing your thing, started this company, uh, working at this company in venture capital. And then then something happened. So I want, Tristan, I want you to take us back to February 19th, 2021. And just tell us like where, where you were in your life at that time. Yeah. So Jordan and I had just moved from New York City to Kansas City. We had been in New York for a decade. We absolutely loved it, but we knew we wanted to make some substantive changes for our life and our family. And so we moved to Kansas City. We were living downtown in an apartment. And this was during part of the peak of the pandemic. Mm. So this was right in 2021. And I had just received an offer from Flyover Capital. It's one of the region's top venture capital firms. And they asked me to join the partnership as a managing partner. And so we as a family were, we were, you know, at the peak of a uh, peak of existence. It was all of our dreams were coming true. And, uh, and then suddenly, uh, everything went south very quickly. All right. So what happened to take us in back into the, I mean, and this is going to be, we're going to, we're going to bring in Jordan too, because this is, you don't remember some of these things you were, you know, you were, you had a medical emergency, but Tristan, what do you take us back to that day and, and what were you experiencing? So this was back Friday. It's, uh, it's February, it's cold. It's, Kansas City, we had just had a major uh, winter storm, negative 10, 15 degrees. And during that period, I uh, I wasn't feeling exactly well uh, for a couple of days there, right up to that Friday. And I had taken my temperature, it was 104 degrees. That's obviously a very serious temperature. And over the next 20 or 30 minutes, I kept taking it and it went back to normal. And so I think naturally you just assume it's a broken thermometer. So largely disregarded it, went to bed that Thursday night into Friday, had a great night's sleep and woke up fine Friday. Because I wasn't feeling well prior though, we had scheduled a test at the local local Walgreens. So this was a time that COVID tests were just becoming a thing. You had to go to the store. Mm-hmm to have these tests done to a pharmacy. And 
So we did the drive through, the results came back negative. We got them about an hour later. And going into that late afternoon, early evening on Friday, I started having difficulty breathing and not painful, not in a deeply concerning way. Just I recall sitting on the edge of my bed and thinking, it, it feels like I'm struggling to breathe. I'm not getting a full breath. Like I'm, it feels like I'm doing an athletic feat right now and I'm not, I'm just sitting on my bed. And so I told Jordan, I need you to take me to the ER. And she eventually acquiesced and said, let's, okay, let's take a step back for the record. <laughs> I thought Tristan was having a man cold because, you know, a paper cut is, you know, a one out of 10, it's a 10. He had a fever, He's tender. It's a 10. He's tender. He's he's a he's a sensitive person. Yeah. And so when he doesn't feel well, he does not feel well. So when he said, I have a cold, my temperature is high, but it went down. We're negative for COVID. I was thinking, you just got the job offer of your dreams today. Mm. Literally today. Wow. I think you're just coming down off of a professional high. Mm. So I said, let's not go to the hospital. Let's just have you take a shower and maybe go to bed early. And it did take some convincing for Tristan to say, no, I really think I need to get seen. Mm. And as you know, he was packing up some stuff. I wrote down all of his medicines and allergies. We put that in his pocket just so he'd have it, just in case. Because you couldn't go in to the driving, hospital at that point. I couldn't. Right. I was not allowed. I had to sit into the parking lot. Uh. And I remember him looking at me. We were about five minutes from the hospital. And he said, I just want you to know that I love you. And that is truly, this was, you know, two days into him not feeling 100%. And this was like two hours into us even talking about going to the hospital. That's the first time I really started to take it seriously because I got nervous because he was nervous. Now, by the way, I'm I'm just having a lot of feelings right now because they love you both so much. So if I <laughs> keep going, but this is hard. Okay, keep going. Well, and so Jordan drops me off at the entrance to the ER. Again, she can't go in, so it's just me. Mm -hmm. And I walk into the ER and I, I go through the check-in process. I hand them my driver's license and my insurance and they, they tell me, take a seat. So I end up sitting down for literally maybe 15 seconds. Mm -hmm. The nurse calls my name, asks me to go to the triage room. So I walk into the triage room. She uh, puts a pulse ox on my, on my finger and has her stethoscope and listens to my heart. And she immediately says, you need to come back with me right now. So we progress into, it's an ER, and so there's a series of, of kind of different bays and rooms. And she walks me into one of those bays. I remember sitting down on the bed, laying down, and there's one nurse in the room and suddenly two and then three and then five and then 10. And there's just, there are so many people that it feels like everybody who works in the ER on this Friday night is in my ER bag. And it's not a very comfortable size. Bag. Mm. And no one is answering me. I'm asking questions. What's going on? Tell, tell me what you're saying. And everyone is ignoring you. And when you're the patient, and no one is making eye contact with you, you know something serious is happening. Mm -hmm. So finally a gentleman comes in and he's wheeling this large machine. I don't know what it I don't know what it is at the time. FOMO. FOMO. Jordan, while this is going on, what's going on with you? How are you feeling? Uh, I was sitting in the car and I was mad that he was not texting me back. Because I said, What do you want for dinner? There's, you know, X is over here and Y is over here. Would you rather have one or the other? That's truly the mindset that I was in was that he was having a bit of maybe an anxiety attack, maybe pneumonia. Because on the way down, he said, you know, I feel like I can't breathe. Mm -hmm. And he was having a really hard time articulating how he was feeling. So I said, is it sharp? Does it feel like you're, you're not able to get a good deep breath? And he said, no, it feels like somebody's sitting on my chest. And I said, Tristan, is there a chance you're having a heart attack? Because that's the only thing I've ever heard of is weights on your chest equals heart attack. Mm -hmm. But he's 31. Mm -hmm. He's healthy. And he said, no, I don't think it's my heart. My heart feels fine. And unbeknownst to us, 
the reason he was having trouble breathing was because his heart wasn't pumping well, which causes fluid back up, which made the only indicator for us that something was wrong, thank goodness, was he was having flash pulmonary edema, Wow, which is fluid buildup in the lungs. Yeah. So when he went in, he truly walked in on his own two feet. He was fine on the outside. On the inside, everything was failing and he was minutes away from dying without medical intervention, which is quite remarkable. So I had zero expectation that I would be sitting in the parking lot for more than 30 minutes. I thought they'd give him some oxygen. They'd give him a steroid. We'd go grab some dinner. I would say, okay, maybe you were right. Maybe it wasn't a true man cold, Mm -hmm. but that's what I thought was going to happen. Instead, I sat in the parking lot for a couple of hours and didn't want to leave because my thought was that he's going to be out really soon. And the last thing I want him to think is that I I left and I abandoned him. <laughs> so I waited. I called our parents. Uh, my parents are local. His parents were in a different state. And I said, something's going on. I, I can't get any information back. Tristan had texted me. My heart rate's high. And I'm in the back. And those are the last two things I heard from him. And then he stopped responding to my texts. And... I drove home to take our dog out because she had been sitting at home for hours and hours by that point. And I missed a call from Tristan. And I thought, dang it, you know, I've been, I've been ready this entire time. While I was in the elevator to take our dog out, I missed a call from him. So I called back and it was the hospital and they asked me if I was his wife. And I said, yes. And they said, well, let's tell you what happened. And everything was in the past tense. And that really scared me. So I had to stop them truly, and say, is he alive? Mm. Why are we speaking in the past tense? And they said, he's alive for now, but we need to we need to get you up to speed on what's happening. But most importantly, would you consent to having him flown to a different hospital? And I don't have a medical background uh, at all, but I started asking a handful of questions. I thankfully had a notepad next to me so I could write down the notes. They explained that, thankfully, someone had taken a test to see if his heart was doing okay. And they noticed that his heart was severely damaged and there was no explanation as to why other than heart failure. So they were able to very quickly put him on a ventilator and start doing life-saving measures. I did consent to have him flown to a different hospital. I called his parents, they booked the first flight and I drove to the ICU. And that's kind of where our nightmare weekend Truly began. So this is now Friday at midnight. I walked in and it was so dark and quiet, which is what you expect midnight in a hospital. And there was one room that was super bright and there was a lot of activity, tons of people running in and out. And I assumed that might be where he was. So I walked up and I said, my name is Jordan Mace. I think you have my husband. And they said, oh, this is the wife. This is the wife. And then it got really quiet. And I I looked and he was just sleeping on the bed. You know, he looked fine. (laughs) When you think dying, you think bloody or bruised or broken. He just looked like he was taking a quick snooze. And they started forcefully, carefully asking every question about his medical history. Well, what's his blood type? How much does he weigh? How tall is he? Has he had surgeries? What medicines is he on? Is it possible he accidentally overdosed on his medicine? I said no, but they said, well, just in case we'll pump his stomach. And I said that, okay, sure. Do everything you possibly can. And that's when they said, what are his wishes? Does he want to be brought back? Mm. And that's when I realized how bad he was. They brought in a chaplain, encouraged me to say goodbye. And they asked me, is there literally anything else that you haven't told us that we need to know? And I said, yes, Tristan is going to be a dad. I am just about three months pregnant. And we had just found out a couple weeks prior Mm. that I was expecting our first child. And when I said that something changed in that room, they were already operating at a very high level and it just went into overdrive. And I remember an incredible doctor that was taking care of the majority of the, the team. And he brought me to the side and said, I'm going to do everything I can to save your husband. He needs to meet his child. Do you know how hearts work? drew out a heart, explained to me why it was failing. And we got to work. Uh, They said, if he can stay alive until the sun comes up, we will put him on something called ECMO. And that is a machine that acts as your heart and your lungs. And I said, yes, absolutely. If that's what we have to do, sounds great. I consent. 
And they said, to be clear, once you put him on, he's not coming off. Mm. His heart is never going to beat on its own again. Mm -hmm. So I had been awake by that point for about, I would say, 36, 40 hours pregnant. And I said, okay, well, if his heart's never going to beat on its own, is he on a machine the rest of his life? Like, what are we talking about? And they said, no, we need you to read this binder. You have an hour end to end. And we need you to let us know what your thoughts are. And they handed me a binder about heart transplants. And they said, it only matters if he makes it to the sunrise. And I said, okay. What is in this and binder? What's in this binder? Like, this, this is the binder this is, that you by were way, supposed to read. It's so weird, read. right? Like, we, just looking back, he says, like, what? <laughs> Keep going. Sorry. <laughs> well, we know how it ends in the sense right, that right, but it's crazy. Here. So we're grateful Woo. for that. But yes, this binder, it's what patients, uh, potential heart transplant recipients review over the course of six months mm. to determine whether or not they should be listed for an organ transplant. And that's how long it usually takes, yeah. four to six months. There are a battery of tests that are run. They need to make sure a variety of things to ensure that you are the right person for this organ, that you are in a, a place in your health that you can even accept an organ. And they asked me if I could consent really quickly because we just didn't have a lot of time. Mm. And they were willing to list him as quickly as possible because he was so healthy 12 hours ago and now he's just about dead. And we were very fortunate that they – explained as much as they could to me that I was able to make quick decisions. We were fortunate to have incredible health insurance that made this possible and a team at KU Medical that was willing to take on a fairly risky surgery. They listed him. He was an emergency status one and he got a heart. He had a, an offer for a heart that very first night. Wow. So that would be Saturday night. Okay. He walked in Friday night, got a heart Saturday night once he was listed Saturday afternoon. FOMO. FOMO. Hearing the story, I mean, I've heard the story before, but hearing it from you is, is a whole other thing, Jordan. You know, we, this was around this time, we, I remember, Kristen, you were supposed to come to an event on Zoom back when everybody was living on Zoom all the time, and you didn't make it. And it's not like you, because you're a very reliable person. And we started asking, we were very concerned, and we, we reached out to your brother, Jordan, and uh, Garrett and we we there was we knew something was up. We knew something was up, but we didn't know. And of course, later on, we heard what was going on. And the fact that your original this is something that I kind of blew my mind is the original heart didn't work out. Talk about that, because that that's something that I just kind of blew my mind at the time. Sure. So when Tristan was on the ECMO machine, which was acting as his heart and his lungs, they were doing as many things as they could to keep his body alive for that heart. And they'd put in a, a balloon in his heart to try and help. They put in an impella device, which is a motor that tries to help remove the fluid. These are all about as uh, critical and life-saving as you could possibly imagine. Mm -hmm. And they also have pretty rough after effects. So at one point we were deciding, do we keep the impella in his body or do we have his foot amputated? Like that's, it was, these were remarkable decisions that were having to be made uh, minute over minute. And the easiest decision was saying yes to the heart. We were grateful. Most people wait months and months to get listed and then months and months to get high enough to even have a match. And we were having this happening, it felt like, in nanoseconds. And that also was so devastating when it came crashing down. That first night, a heart was made available. That was a match. And it was too small. Hmm. At some point in the rigmarole of getting Tristan listed and a match, his height and weight had been entered incorrectly. Hmm. And that small error meant that the size of heart, the volume of heart he would need was bigger than the match that he had. And they were not willing to place a heart that wouldn't be appropriate for his body in his body. And they ended up having to turn that down and he went back on the list. We ultimately don't know where that error came from. What we do know is there are manual steps in the listing process and in the matching process. And so when that first match occurred that Saturday night, my medical team had accepted it at KU. Jordan had accepted it. And we know that sometimes throughout that process, from that acceptance, there was an error. 
So the height and weight for myself Mm. and the height and weight of that potential donor were incompatible. In other words, when you think about a heart, a heart effectively, you think about pumping volume, pumping capacity. And so you want to match those as closely as possible. And so what ended up transpiring is that because of that, that human error somewhere in that process, that that heart was rejected by my team. And unfortunately, given the circumstances of procurement and the limited time that exists around recovering organs and transporting them to patients in need, we're unsure if that heart was ever utilized. Mm. And so in a seemingly beautiful outcome here, there's also a potential of tragedy that a heart may have been non-utilized in this process Mm. too. Now I'm looking back as we're talking at my text messages and I see that I texted you on March 10th, which was very soon after that. And you responded. And I think now that I know it's amazing. Then you sent me a text that was just a lot of random characters. You probably sat on your phone for goodness sake, but you, you reached out to some friends and you told us what was going on and we did a zoom and I remember seeing you and you looked so great. And I think it's one of those things about this stuff is that like you've been through this heavy medical procedure, but you know, you you bounce right back and you're, and it's like, so it was really quite amazing. Now, obviously like it's an ongoing thing and, and it's something you struggle with all the time. So it's, we're not minimizing here and we we can talk about that more, but it was, I'd never, you know, I, I, I'd not actually, I had a cousin who had a lung transplant many years ago, but I hadn't had a close friend who um, who had, you know, not many people know somebody who's had a heart transplant. Um, and so it was, you know, as we joined you on your journey and you, your friends started to hear about this, um, you know, it was it was pretty amazing. And, you know, you wake up, talk about that, that time because we're gonna talk a lot more about the work you're doing next week when we get into that. But talk about what it's been like, you know, your, your recovery, what your, your life is like now and, and, and give us a sense of, of, of that whole period of time. So I actually woke up two times mm-hmm. and I can explain that. But so the, the first time I woke up, I was trans, transplanted Monday. I woke up about 10 days later after that. And Jordan was in the room and there was a nurse in the room. I'm in the ICU and waking up and reaching a semi level of consciousness. And the nurse who had never interacted with before Mm -hmm. on my own capacity says, do you want to hear something funny? You had a heart transplant. And the mind, I don't think, can truly process what that means at the time. I I recall instances throughout that effectively two-week period of significant physical pain. I remember a lot more mentally than most patients do that are in those circumstances. I had written incomplete sentences, actually, to Jordan while I was sedated Mm. under. And so I knew through that journey that there was a real struggle and that I was waiting on something. I had no idea that was heart or what that would ultimately look like. So when I woke up, there, there was this air of, of magic. And I, I mean that in a capital M magic mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. that I've lived some through something that I certainly shouldn't have lived through that. I have my mental capacity that I'm able to think competently. I'm able to talk and speak and yet simultaneously not understanding the realization of the complications of what it means to be a transplant recipient. So Jordan, I have this magical 12 hour period. I'm alive. I get to meet my uh, soon to be child. uh, And I did well for about 12 hours Mm -hmm. and then my lungs crashed. And so they failed again. And so this was, this was on uh, Monday morning and I remember people asking me questions and I kept saying, sounds good. 
to every question that somebody would say. And I would just also say it as a, a factual statement too. And I saw the most brilliant colors that came that you could ever describe. If you if you remember the iTunes equalizer uh, and and kind of visual <laughs> yeah, I mean, I from 15 years ago yeah. that are just as a song would play, it's just this beautiful spectrum of colors. Mm-hmm. That's exactly what I saw. And so my lungs failed again. I went back on a ventilator for another week and I ended up getting a trach, which is essentially they cut a hole and, um, and it provides oxygen support. So they're not having to extubate you and re intubate you, which can cause some significant damage. So I woke up that second time and that second time was profoundly different than the first that sense of magic was gone. I could not speak. So because of the trach, it impacts where the, where it's placed, Mm. air doesn't reach your vocal cords. So you're not able to communicate at all verbally. So I was limited to communicating with finger squeezes and eventually trying to write on a effectively a little dry erase board. But that was also the point that my I started to Jordan had done this amazing board on on the wall and it was it was all of these photos and memories of people in my life of events in my life and I recall looking at this board thinking some of these people look familiar but a lot don't and I don't know what that means and maybe I'm still in a very unfamiliar, very uncomfortable environment. I'm just waking up. I'll certainly remember these people. I'm I'm in these photos. I'm smiling. I'm laughing. This is me. And that kept precipitating as I was going through recovery that those memories, those people weren't coming back to me. It's, There's something called ICU delirium, Mm -hmm. and that is what we were expecting of him. He had been under for so long, under but aware. Mm -hmm. That's what you were saying, Tristan, when you said you know more than most people across those two weeks. He was under, but he was aware. Mm -hmm. So we would play country music. We'd play 80s pop music for him because it's very lonely. It's discombobulating. There's a bunch of sounds. You have no idea as you're coming in and out of consciousness. So when he woke up the first time, that was Tristan. He was back. It's the magical, I think is the best way to describe it. Whenever you have something where you said, man, if I just had one more day, Mm. if I had one more conversation, if I could have one more lunch with that loved one, wouldn't that be a gift? We had that. Mm. And then he went down again. And when he woke up later uh, without the ability to speak, without the ability to use his hands, by that point, he had atrophied about 40 pounds in about a month, Mm -hmm. which was remarkable. Mm. The reason, Tristan, I put those pictures on the wall, we called it the happy board later, was because the the nursing staff, the team, they wanted to know what he was supposed to look like wow. so that they could see what healthy looked like. And in the process, I tried to make him a human. He was this patient on a bed that couldn't move, but I wanted people to see that he's the dad of a dog named Queso, and he has a huge affinity for the Houston Astros. And look, this was us getting married. This is a fully fledged three dimensional important person Mm. that I am so grateful that you are caring for and please do everything you can to save him, period. It it was one of those things where I was trying to humanize him. And when he woke up the second time, I had no idea that he was suffering from some memory loss. Mm. We thought this was ICU delirium. We thought he was a bit groggy. We thought all the ins and outs, you know, a new heart in the body, your brain's broken trying to figure that one out when you thought you went in with what <laughs> your wife assured you was a man cold. And so that text, Patrick, that you got, that was me. He couldn't use his wow, hands. Wow, I had no idea. We were, we were Thank you not for wanting that. to tell people. Yeah. Absolutely. That you all sent flowers and we appreciate it. The thing is, is he had just gotten that job offer mm. and I didn't want him to lose out on the job. I wanted him to be able to have the choice if he could work, that he could work at the job that he wanted to. So we kept it exceptionally private. Yeah. 
we told next to no one. We said, he's having a medical emergency. He's unable to be on his computer. I didn't say, he's in a coma. He got a new heart. He can't use his hands. He has no idea who you are. That was something that we very much kept to ourselves for a while, yeah. apart from folks like you, people that we were very comfortable sharing what was happening to us in real time as we were trying to process this unimaginable thing that to your point, I didn't know anybody that had an organ transplant. I was an organ donor because I knew that that was something I wanted to do, but that was the extent I had ever thought about organs and organ donation until it was smack dab right in front of us. And we were on the, we were on the benefiting side. We were the one getting this life-saving gift to get more time. And that's why we're so passionate about trying to make this type of outcome, hopefully more accessible for all. All right, we're going to leave it there for this week. And you've just, and Jordan, maybe we should have you just host this show for now because you just edited it perfectly. We'll be back next week with more on this story and with what Jordan and Tristan are doing together to address challenges in this space. But until then, take care of yourselves, FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on the web at FOMOSapiens.com or PatrickMcGinnis.com, where you can get all kinds of free resources to live a more decisive and entrepreneurial life. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstra. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO.